Hello. I would like to begin by apologizing for not being able to attend the symposium in person. And I would like to thank the organizers for allowing me to present my paper virtually. My paper is titled The Entanglements of Emancipation and Juvenile Discipline in the Early Black Prison Memoir. And I offer a reading of Austin Reed's The Life and Adventures of a Haunted Convict. Austin Reed's The Life and Adventures of a Haunted Convict is the earliest known prison memoir by a black inmate in American literary history. It was acquired by Yale University's Beinecke Rare Books Library in 2009 and authenticated and prepared for publication by Caleb Smith in 2016. Reed was born in New York in 1823 in a nominally free black family. And his memoir was written between 1858 and 1859 during his incarceration in the Auburn State Prison and briefly in the Clinton State Prison. While there has been a rich body of scholarship on the work since its publication, my paper focuses on a relatively underexplored dimension of the text, Reed's portrayal of juvenile delinquency particularly regarding his incarceration in the New York House of Refuge from 1833 to 1839. The work begins with the death of the narrator's father, an event that can be seen as the prison memoir's nod to its literary antecedent, the criminal confession, which linked absent fathers with criminal predilections in young men. This recurrent trope in 19th century literature helps us historicize the infamous 1965 Moynihan Report, which egregiously suggested that absent fathers and single mother-led families cause criminal behavior in Black youth. Reed's father's dying words expressed a hope that he, and I quote, be kept from all the snares and temptations of the world so that he may become a useful man an injunction that the young Reed flouts with abandon. In fact, the phrase useful man is especially instructive because the work's abolitionist imaginary is rooted in Reed becoming its very antithesis, a criminal who shuns work and has a vexed, if not outright antagonistic relationship with normative masculinity. Reed commits his first act of crime disguised as a young girl, shortly after his father's death, when he decides to exact revenge for the physical torture he experiences as an indentured servant in the estate of a man named Mr. Ladd. In the mid 19th century, masquerade laws were enacted across the nation and nonconformism to gender binaries became criminalized. New York passed a law in 1845, which prohibited individuals from having, and I quote, their face painted, discolored, covered or concealed or be otherwise disguised while in a road or public highway, unquote. Cross-dressing remains an important trope even in Reed's later crimes. His criminality is thus an embodied one. He performs it not only through his acts, but also through his body. Reed's indenture was symptomatic of the precarious freedom of Black youth in antebellum New York. The state enacted the Gradual Emancipation Act, and I have a timeline for you right here. Um, the state enacted the Gradual Emancipation Act in 1799, which freed children born to enslaved mothers, but required them to work as indentured servants for their mother's owners throughout their youth. In 1817, the act was amended to abolish the enslavement of children born after 1799. Legal slavery in all its forms was formally abolished in New York in 1827. However, long after these legislations, abductions of free Black New Yorkers with the purpose of selling them into Southern slavery grew at an alarming rate in the mid 19th century. And Freedom's Journal, the nation's first African-American newspaper, reported this phenomenon as, and I quote, acts of kidnapping not less cruel than those committed on the coast of Africa, unquote. This was further exacerbated by the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which allowed Southern slaveholders to pursue and recapture escaped slaves in states where slavery had been abolished. 
The most direct evidence of this can be seen in the emergence of a group called the Blackbirders in the Five Points, whose members made a living by capturing fugitive and free Black New Yorkers into slavery. In New York City, the proposal for creating a carceral institution specifically for children and youth was first put forth by Reverend John Stanford in 1815, who suggested work, education, and religion as prime means to alter deviant behavior. Part of the children's time would be spent in learning manufacturing skills, the remainder in learning elementary academic subjects. The refuge opened in 1825 and grew out of the philanthropic activities and concerns of the Society for the Prevention of Pauperism. It was the culmination of the penal reform efforts of two prominent Quaker public intellectuals, Thomas Eddy and John Griscom. They saw the institution as a social ant antidote for the rise in poverty and crime following the War of 1812. This historical framing lays bare two important features of early carceral discourses on childhood. Childhood itself was not a key heuristic within these debates, and juvenile delinquency was viewed as a symptom of socioeconomic deprivation. Additionally, labor was central to the carceral framing of childhood, and the thrust was in transforming incarcerated children from being delinquents into the working poor. Reed's work lies at the intersections of Atlantic world ideas of prison and educational reform. English philosopher Jeremy Bentham's treatises tracks on the education of youth and tracks on the means of supporting the poor and preventing idleness and, and vagrancy were foundational in advocating education as a disciplinary tool for incarcerated and vagrant youth. As a representative work of early American prison writing, Reed's memoir lends itself well to theorizations of the ways in which literacy shapes the writer's position as a carceral subject. Being incarcerated during a substantial part of his youth meant that Reed acquired much of his formal education within the prisons of the prison. <clears throat> Instead of viewing literacy as a counter-narrative to the prison's disciplinary mechanism, the narrative invites us to see it as one of its key constituents. Reed informs us that juvenile inmates in the refuge were placed in separate cells all night and by day were not allowed to communicate while receiving instruction or performing work. They were also divided by gender and then grades. Uh, and, and supervised labor and moral education dictated their daily schedule. Grades ranged from one to four based upon the behavior of the child in the refuge, one representing the best behavior and four the worst, thereby creating hierarchies for rehabilitation and rewarding pliancy. Incarcerated male children did manufacturing work such as making furniture, brass nails, brushes, and shoes, and female inmates learned domestic skills. They spent much of the day making uniforms and working in the laundry. So the illustration that I have for you right here, uh, it, it shows exactly how much the refuge resembles the 19th century factory. The House of Refuge thus not only mirrored the 19th century factory, but also operated as a figurative factory for producing and normalizing gendered labor. Reed's memoir thus theorizes the role of literacy in molding what Bridget Fielder has memorably called the carceral child. When the young narrator is first inducted into the House of Refuge, his uh, dedication to, to his um, academic pursuits leads a white prison official named Mr. Seymour to mockingly call him a scholar. And he adds disparagingly, and I quote, I think I can make something out of that darkie, unquote. These lines are redolent with both cruel irony and explanatory potential. 
while the desire to make something out of a black child speaks to prison education's goal of making legible and utilitarian subjects, the idea of the black child as a scholar is put forth as absurd. And the young narrator's vulnerability is seen in his inability to recognize this racial disparagement until later in his life. In fact, he boasts of his academic accomplishments in the refuge in the following lines. And this is a longish quote that I'm about to read out. Then were the days when I would challenge old England or America to throw down any history before me and let me read it through just once. And I was the boy that would stand before any historian that ever stood between England and America and argue with him on the subject of which I had been reading. I had such a greedy appetite for reading that I was called up before Mr. Williams, the school teacher, one day and laid across the stool where I got 15 cuts with the rattan for having more than one book in my desk. The punishment that the narrator receives for his voracious reading lays bare the punitive rather than the rehabilitative purpose of early prison education. Reading more than what the prison deemed necessary was potentially subversive, for it had the potential of turning regimentation into enjoyment and, result and resultantly protest. Understanding racialized juvenile discipline in Reed's work requires us to examine the history of childhood itself. The notion of childhood as a stage of life and metaphoric childhood as a stage of civilizational progress have overlapping histories. The Enlightenment associated childhood with innocence and vulnerability, with John Locke famously describing it as tabula rasa or a blank slate, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau suggesting in his work Emile that there is no original perversity in the human heart. These theories of childhood fueled widely divergent political movements from, from pro-slavery sentiments to abolitionism to the enforced assimilation and infantilization of immigrants and Native Americans, the latter infamously through the American Indian residential schools, which much like Reed's memoir, perfectly exemplified early American racialized juvenile punishment. Reed's representation of black childhood ruptures the discourse of what Robin Bernstein terms racial innocence, a raced definition of childhood which normativizes whiteness and plays a critical role in 19th century racial formation. Reed escapes from the house of refuge thrice and ultimately ends up serving a long sentence at the Auburn State Prison. Unlike his fellow white inmates at the refuge, whose tryst with childhood incarceration does not produce recidivism, but rehabilitation, Reed finds himself becoming a long-term carceral subject. Thus, while punishment's goal is to manage the labor force, its ways of management are racially coded. Juvenile punishment turns the white working class delinquent into a wage laborer, while it turns the black delinquent almost invariably into a repeat offender and an incarcerated worker. Though the House of Refuge did not deny youth based on race, and its facilities were not racially segregated, it is crucially important to Note that Black children did not constitute a significant demographic in the refuge. Most of the incarcerated youths in the refuge were children of working class Catholic immigrants, primarily Irish, Italian, and Polish. In fact, by 1855, a staggering 63% of the children incarcerated in the House of Refuge were of Irish descent. Unlike the Philadelphia House of Refuge for Colored Children, there was no juvenile facility exclusively for Black youth in New York. What then are we to make of both the small number of Black youth in the House of Refuge and the absence of pointedly racialized detention facilities for Black youth? Could it simply be that the state was more punitive toward white working class immigrant youth than their Black counterparts? 
While reading the data superficially might certainly suggest so, such a reading obscures the larger narrative. What becomes clear is that Black youth were not viewed as subjects of prison reform because there was no concerted thought on the part of either the state or civil society to facilitate an assimilation of Black children into the citizenry. While reform itself was a form of class warfare, Black youth were considered at this time unfit subjects for social reform. In New York, convicted Black youth were typically apprenticed, indentured, or simply sent to adult prison. Reed's presence in the House of Refuge was thus more anomalous than representative. And yet this anomaly helps us understand how juvenile discipline served as a crucial site of race making. What distinguishes Reed from the white detainees is the determinism that undergirds his experiences of incarceration. Reed's escapes from the penal system are always short-lived. And after his many escapes from the House of Refuge, he finds himself incarcerated first at the Clinton State Prison and later at the Auburn State Prison. In other words, juvenile discipline for Black youth was not a mechanism to create docile laborers as it was for working class white immigrants, but rather to create permanent carceral subjects, a form of lumpen proletariat devoid of any class consciousness. The narrator's interactions with the refugees' Irish inmates are thematically significant. His method of resisting the House of Refuge's labor regimes and its racialization of its subjects lies in the affection that he lavishes on the Irish youth he's incarcerated with, whom he fondly refers to as, and I quote, me brave Irish boys. Particularly significant in this regard is a play that the young detainees perform for the prison officials. In this play, Reed takes on the role of a Native American man, and Mike, an Irish inmate, cross-dresses as a woman that he's in love with. These race and gender performances invoke the racialized frontier myths of militant indigenous masculinity, masculinity and characterize the Irish immigrant as feminine outsiders within the de facto definition of citizenship as white male property and Protestant. The invisibility of the black subject and the erasure of the narrator's own embodied blackness within these racial axes is telling, for it positions racial blackness not just as outside of citizenship, but as antithetical to it. The work further complicates the author narrator's political affinities by articulating righteous rage against Yankees for their discriminatory treatment against working class Irishmen. Reed writes, and again, this is a longish quote. All you daredevil Yankees who run down the poor Irishmen as they land upon your docks and point the finger of scorn at them and look upon them with a sneer of disgrace while he or she stands shivering in poverty and clothed in rags of disgrace and shame, while love and freedom is planted deep in his breast and he's passed by the rich and the poor who refuse to give him one word of consolation. So what is glaringly obvious in Reed's memoir is that there is little to no engagement with racial violence against black New Yorkers. Instead, Reed direct, directs his ire against the mistreatment of the Irish. In fact, one could argue that Reed's civic self-fashioning is premised on the feminizing of the working class Irish subject and positioning himself as their protector. I propose that there are two ways of reading this curious self-effacement. The first is to see Reed tacitly informing his readers that Black youth were indeed not the intended subjects of the, of the House of Refuge's disciplinary reformism, and thus such racial erasure was inevitable. The second is to see Reed's relationships with the Irish inmates as a kind of syncretic utopianism. 
one that focuses on commonality of socioeconomic conditions rather than the sameness of race. This utopianism is arguably rendered more subversive because it is premised both on political camaraderie and sexual desire, which upsets the intertwined carceral logics of both heteronormativity and racialized differentiation. In other words, Reed helps us dismantle and provincialize racial whiteness, offering us glimpses not only of the racialized genealogy of juvenile discipline, but also the processes through which working class European immigrants were assimilated into whiteness. To conclude then, Austin Reed's memoir helps us map the overlapping epistemologies of childhood race and citizenship, reminding us that the modern prison and its allied disciplinary institutions did not merely devise ways of turning poor youth into industrial workers, but shaped definitions of childhood itself, setting seen and unseen boundaries of who gets to be a child and who does not, and deciding who is reformable and who's irredeemable along racial lines. Thank you.